So, um, a very warm welcome to uh, those of you who are on the, the committee. It's great that you're here, and a, a, an even warmer welcome to those of you who have uh, chosen to to come to the the, the AGM. Um, it's uh, is a, a very important part of the branch's activity. It's something that we are, are obliged to do, and there's a, a certain protocol that we'll we'll go through. Um, but I'm delighted uh, to to see that you you here, share Gillian, um, and uh, who else? I don't know. Richard. I know we conversed on on email um, previously. So fantastic. Um, the danger, of course, is rocking up to AGM that you're going to end up getting a job. Uh, so <laughs> I'm very pleased that you're here. <laughs> Tremendous. Thank you. Um, so, for those of you who don't know me, my name's uh, Alice Rance. I'm the the, uh, the chair of the the Northeast branch, um, and I'm I'm very pleased to to welcome you to uh, our our AGM. So, the uh, it's a certain um, structure of things to to do. Um, <clears throat> done the welcomes, and the, the, we won't we won't go through and and get each of you to introduce yourself. That that save you that that embarrassment. Um, I have no apologies um, for absence, um, so that, that's that's fine. Um, the, I hope that you've all had the chance to see the minutes from the the previous AGM, which we had in, in July 2019, um, and are very kindly hosted at Newcastle Uni. Uh, if I can just check for. Uh, matters of accuracy or indeed inaccuracy before we accept those as a, a true record. I'm going to work on the assumption that silence is, is uh, golden and that you are approving uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the minutes. Um, Alistair. Yeah. Who's that? It's Klaus Michael, KB. Klaus, how are you? <laughs> how are you? I just wanted to check. I can't see anyone but you. I just wanted to sort of check whether you can actually hear us. I can hear you. I, 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 I'm not, because I, I'm not uh, entirely sure um, of the, the the protocol that, and, and the way we've set that, the way this is set up for the BCS, it is only set up for me and the presenter as to to be on video i'm afraid um, I you, uh, alistair i think if you choose to you can right click on people's name and make them present there and that'll enable the video for us if you want to it's up to you okay i'm going to try you then ian oh i can do all sorts of things i can make you presenter is that what you mean so if you make me present, I think my video, I can then make my video come on. Did anything happen? Oh, there you are. Oh, hey, yeah. Man, I love technology, me. You think it was a professor of computer science or something. It's uh, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> now, you, I'm not going to be able to get rid of you now, so you're going to have to stay, you realise. But well, that's fine, you know. Your vice chair, that's okay. Uh, it's tremendous. Um, uh, and anybody else wants to get themselves on Celebrity Squares, you can do that too. Um, so, oh no, I've lost you all. The uh, the so the the matters arising uh, from the, the the minutes. So there was nothing uh, contentious uh, that isn't in the 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 agenda. The um, and, and why I'm saying uh, about uh, colleagues maybe getting themselves involved with the, the committee, one of the, the the real matters arising from last year was trying to address the gender balance on the, both in the committee um, and indeed in the, the those presenting uh, to, to, to the branch. So if any female colleagues wish to um, Come on to the the the, uh, the committee, which isn't particularly onerous, I have to say. Then we'd be delighted uh, to to welcome you. Um, if we can look at ways to get uh, more 
uh, female colleagues involved uh, across the the whole uh, of the the group, then that would be 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 tremendous. Um, so doing the formal bits, I'd really like to to thank everyone uh, present and indeed those not present who have uh, helped to. Uh, keep us going in what has been a, a, a particularly strange year. The, um, we we uh, had reasonable uh, performance up until uh, February, but of course, since, uh, uh, since lockdown, we've been in a, a very, very strange situation. Um, I, again, I'd like to thank Klaus Michael um, for organising the Christmas event at SAGE, um, and that was becoming a bit of an annual event and I really hope that we're able to do something this Christmas um, face to face but uh, I'm not sure that, that that'll happen and I'd like we'll to probably have to go rogue for that <laughs> well I don't know if anyone was at the Dynamites Awards last Wednesday we had a, a, a virtual event and so you can do networking uh, virtually I'm not so sure that the what was it Remo was that the software? Um, oh, you're on mute, Dean. Do I have to unmute you? I can't even find you now. There you go. Hello. Here you go. Yeah, it was interesting when you could click on different tables to move around to do network, and it was unusual i think you could go between floors as well yeah no it was very bizarre and uh yes but so we, we, we might be able to do something like that that of that i think Veeam was actually quite expensive to to hire out um but if dynamo are using it they, you pay a monthly license and there's no limit on the number of times that you can use it so we might hopefully we'll, we, we could join up with them uh and, and utilize that uh, if, that, if that happens in, in December. Um, but I would like to formally uh, thank Marie Settersfield uh, at the BCS, who is our, our point of contact, and she's been uh, absolutely fantastic in helping us and supporting us. Um, the, we went, I mean, we, as you'll see in a second, we, we had a reasonable number of, of uh, uh, talks um, through the autumn last year and, and into the uh, the, the uh, winter um, in, in January and February, uh, but obviously things went uh, on hold in uh, in, in March. Um, we did talk uh, at the committee about uh, whether we wanted to do online events, and it was felt that you know at that time in in, in March that, that folks were. It really had too much um, of the online stuff, uh, and so the uh, we, we 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 held back. Uh, what I did do was open up to the membership uh, presentations and events that were happening in different branches, and I know that a, a number of folks uh, went along to to those. There were some some quite interesting interesting ones. Um, but through the summer, we we relented, and Hannah Underwood gave a talk on. Uh, data for good, which was was really well received, and uh, we had uh, nearly 50 people attend that. So it was uh, it was uh, almost as high as our uh, Sage event at, at Christmas time, which was our, our highest uh, event, where we had uh, nearly 60 people uh, at, at at that. So fantastic. Um, the we, overall, and despite the the, uh, the the restrictions, we've had nearly 200. Different people uh, at uh, at the or 200 people coming to to uh, our, our events, which is 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 commensurate with where we were uh, last year. Um, you know, so we have we had a, a number of talks. So John Timmis talked about AI. Joanna Berry, we had asked to, to talk about digital entrepreneurship. Um, as I say, the the Anne Ledwith and, and Helen Baker did the the event up at, at Sage. Um, Christian Stewart did a, a fascinating talk on uh, cashless society and uh, from from Barclaycard. Hannah picked up um, in 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 July, and then uh, I'm really pleased to say that we've got Stuart Collins um, from Sage uh, coming to to talk with us at a quarter to seven um, th this evening. 
you'd be pleased to know that it doesn't mean that I'm going to talk now for the next half hour. Uh, just it might be that you know I, I gave us a little bit of leeway in case we wanted to uh, uh, have a discussion uh, about things. Um, I was really grateful to to colleagues in in other uh, special interest groups and uh, branches across the BCS who who made their events uh, available available to us. So the next thing, uh, sorry, the, the the other thing to to mention in the um, in the chair's report is that we have uh, continued with our uh, custom and practice of supporting and awarding a prize to the best first year student in the four universities in our uh, in our area uh, and. This year, Jack Reed from Newcastle University, who's doing BCS, BSc Computer Science, um, Daniel Stone from Durham, doing BCS Computer Science, uh, Martina Pani uh, from Northumbria, doing BSc Computer Science with Web Development, uh, and Dan O'Connell uh, from Sunderland, uh, doing BSc Computer Science, are the four uh, people that we will be nominating for, for prizes. Um, it's, it's great that the popularity of that keeps going on. Quite how we're going to get the prizes to them, um, yeah, it might be that we revert to post, but it would be really nice if we can do some kind of, of uh, uh, celebration uh, event. Um, one of the things I, I'm very keen to uh, get off the ground this year is how the uh, student chapters at the four universities might come together under the umbrella of the the northeast uh, branch um to to do some some activities chris uh, i'm going to include you now in this uh wild opportunity yeah. to uh to become a presenter no not not chris bloomfield sorry chris although it'd be great if you're on as well oh, we've Oh, I am here. It's Chris Topham I'm looking for. Somehow I've got the, I don't know how in hell I did that. Chris, I've lost, Chris Topham, I've lost you. Be with me, people. He's gone. Chris, are you there? Yep, I'm on. I should be. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can't okay. find you on the list. Somehow I've managed to get uh, the the website agenda up, and goodness knows how I did that. All right. Oh, you've got that up. I've got the I've got the agenda up, yeah. All right. I was I was hoping to see you. Uh, I don't know how I can get rid of it. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> uh, I'll shut this oh, down. The the important thing is that you, you give us the, the treasurer's okay. report. Yep. Right. Um right, so this is for the financial year 2000, oh, 2019, 2020. Um, and the branch was able to get an operating budget of £1,708 and we also had provisional approval for £1,000 to run a student hackathon event. So although it was disappointing the amount of actual uh, sort of revenue we got, the, it, was, it was very encouraging to be uh, provisionally awarded that uh, money for the student hackathon. Um, Throughout the year, we've been again, we've been very much uh, assisted with the uh, generous provision of meeting locations and uh, and also refreshments from both the universities and from from local companies. And we've also benefited because none of our speakers have asked for any expenses to be uh, awarded. So we ended up at the end of the year with absolutely no expenditure whatsoever on our physical meetings. Um, which, as Alistair was saying, was sadly curtailed by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic in March. Um, 
also the restrictions on physical meetings meant that the our planned uh, student hackathon uh, could no longer be was no longer viable uh, for the financial year so unfortunately that's we've lost the provisional uh, expenditure on that now so the only expenditures which we actually had last year uh, was the student prizes and they totaled 360 pounds which again were awarded uh, um, as Alistair was saying, to the most successful year one students from the four universities. And and we're going to do that the same again this year um, and up to the same value. And it, we must sort of continue to do this because um, some of the uh, areas which have dropped their student awards are no longer allowed to have a budget for them. So as long as we continue awarding them, we'll, we'll will be granted the budget for them, but if we stop, so the funding will stop. So overall, the last year, the branch uh, ended up with an underspend of £1,348. Um, and we've had a warning uh, that any underspends in this current financial year, 2020-2021, uh, could be reallocated during the year. Um, so as, as always, it's going to be a case of use it or lose it, really. The budget we did submit uh, for this current year, uh, we submitted it on schedule, and we were awarded £2,308.74, bizarrely, um, which is up about 35% on the previous year. And <clears throat> this is mainly to cater for some anticipated uh, expenses with the meetings, uh, physical meetings, once we can hopefully restart them in the new year. Um, thinking that we may struggle to, for particularly for outside companies to host in the, in the way they have done in the past, and we may have to put some money in for, for the catering. Um, we also were successful in getting the supplementary funding request uh, provisionally approved for the uh, student chapters to rejuvenate the student chapters, as Alistair was saying earlier as well. So that's £500. Again, that's really going to some require some physical involvement, I would imagine. So again, that's going to be probably into next year as well. Um, <clears throat> the BCS HQ Treasury have said that uh, that they anticipate minimal spend in this this quarter, and that all the budget will be spent in the in starting from January up until uh, August, September time next year. So we're under no real pressure to to, to use the and our award, allocated award until then. Um, and that really, I think, is uh, is really the, the state we are at with our Treasury, really. Well, that, that's fantastic, Chris. Um, and thank you very much for that. And thank you very much for really identifying that um, between now and Christmas, the, the spend um, is going to be minimal, if not not zero. Um, and so it really would be helpful if we can think or, or about, you know, from January onwards, uh, any particular people that we wish to, to invite that is going to incur expenses. Um, and as Chris says, look at how we might uh, get the, the chapters um, back on on stream and, and get that in, involved the you know we don't need to to be limited to um presentations we can do different types of events uh, I, I know that ad has been uh really successful in doing institute of coding events at, at newcastle uh, and tom and and his team at northumbria have done similar so that you know we, there's money that we can spend to do things along those lines you know that so a coding for all type event might uh, come into into the mix for for, a, for example um <clears throat> that's right they've, they've said that there is will be more money for the supplementary funding if we want to, to to do any additional events as well over and above what we've done yeah fantastic thank thanks chris so what we we need to do is is formally approve um though that that financial report um and I need a proposer and a seconder. I'll propose we accept it. I second. Thank you. Uh, Chris, we'll second. second.
Thank you. Thanks. Smashing. That's lovely. And so now we come to the the, the part in the in the uh, proceedings where we we look at the um, the election of office bearers uh, and uh, the committee for for next year. Um, we had a committee meeting last last week um, just to see if anyone wanted to change their uh, uh, the, the role. Um, the, and I'm very pleased to say that we persuaded Chris to, to act as, as treasurer for another year. Thank you very much, Chris Topham. Um, you know, the number of times I've said just another year to you, and it, 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 it keeps working. So great, I love it. Um, I, I have been chair now, I think for for four years. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to carry on. Uh, but if anybody wishes to take over, I'm also very happy to stand down um, because I, I've taken on uh, a role with BCS nationally as, as vice president academic. So I'm, I'm very happy if somebody wishes to, to step up to the plate. Um, I can see the tumbleweed. So thanks for that. Uh, they, so unless anyone wishes to do that, then uh, I propose that we uh, retain the structure of the, the committee um, as was for last year. Um, that would be me acting as chair, Ian as, as, as vice chair, uh, Chris uh, as uh, treasurer, um, other Chris as um, our uh, media guru chris bloomfield and the social media kids um they uh, it's fun you know they're doing a, a great job uh with that and and then the the committee as as was um i do need to speak with the the guys who were uh on the uh the, the young persons group because i think they may have have moved on from the region uh, and I'll, I'll i'll chase those up um but in addition to last year's committee, I also wish to propose that Tom Prickett uh, from Northumbria joins the committee, which then means that all four universities uh, in our geographic area are, are represented in the committee. Uh, and uh, with perfect timing, Richard Sterry uh, contacted me yesterday, um, wishing to uh, get involved with the, the committee and given that uh, a volunteer is worth 10 pressed people um will bite his hand off so uh, thank you richard um if anyone else who's here wishes to get involved in uh, the, the committee business then then please don't be shy we you will be welcomed with open arms particularly grateful if any of our female colleagues would uh, pick up the the opportunity. I should really have brought tumbleweed with me. Um, <laughs> okay, um, I, I, I'll pick that up outside and you know, we will try and, and uh, tr get more uh, uh, female colleagues in, in, involved. Um, so if I propose that committee structure, can someone second it? Second. Second. Okay. Noted, yeah. Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, we, I, I then have to fill, fill this back in um, to, to, to BCS. There's a new chairs form, um, which I, I'll share with you. Uh, which is, it's kind of like minutes, but it's minutes plus. Um, so then, then moves on to uh, a discussion around any other, any other business. Is there anything that anyone would like to to raise? I wanted to ask. Alistair probably more as framed as a question. I mean, sort of going through this kind of COVID 
sort of situation and sort of different ways of uh, working and different ways of meeting. What what do we want to sort of what do we or what can we learn for the kind of working of the uh, local chapter and how could we possibly sort of adjust going forward? I mean, for instance, could we use virtual events? I mean, given that we sometimes have quite long ways to travel, in, had long ways to travel in the past, could we actually, could we, could we complement with virtual? Could we actually get leverage speakers who couldn't actually travel up north uh, more? So what, how could we, what, what, what can we learn or what, where can we sort of... oh, she mean Klaus Michael. So you know that, that you know I, I guess up until Christmas that we we have the um, we're limited to virtual anyway. But are you suggesting a a, a mix of physical and virtual? So we've got you know people in the room and then a couple of tellies with uh, folk beaming in. Yeah, for instance, or speakers I mean, I mean as it depends of course also a little bit i mean comes back to investment because i mean most of this i mean a high quality digital experience doesn't come free either as you sort of rightly noted um but i just i just wonder whether we sort of see virtual as well just a stop gap or whether we can we can sort of yeah leverage that to perhaps sort of transform a little bit our own ways no, no, of, of working no i i think it's a really good idea that that we uh we uh <clears throat> can use both i mean we, bcs are, are are keen that we use go to meeting um and <laughs> the only time i use it is when i do a bcs event which is why my uh they, I'm, I'm still on on teams can I speak? I have enough difficulty moving between Teams and Zoom, to be honest. Um, but I, I, I don't think there's anything stopping us having people uh, dial in or, or come into events remotely. I think it'd be fantastic. You know, if we if we look at the, our geography from from Berwick to to Hartlepool, it's a you know a long way for some folks to go. I think where we could maybe, when we're still in a virtual environment, we could maybe consider if we are hosting online events using the BCS tool, which may be not as good as Teams or other tools is, we could maybe consider recording the event so that we make sure that we can try and publicize the event and the recording as well to try and engage with people more. No, it's a good point. I mean, as it happens, we're, we're going to record Stuart's uh, presentation uh, tonight. Mm -hmm. and I mean, certainly, I mean, I don't, don't know what, how it is for everyone else, but I mean, at this end, I mean, the experience, the WebEx experience is ancient. I mean, I can, I don't know who is actually on the call. I can see you, Alistair, and, and you, Ian, and that's about it. I don't know if there's a way to, for me to put everybody on. Uh... I think if you make for for the BCS member, you can make anybody presenters, um, or, or panelist, or organizer, and that'll get our cameras on. So if I make everybody panelist, yeah, that should enable their cameras to come on, because it changes the go-to control panel depending on what level of access you give. Can you see the panel on your your screen? So yeah, I can see the panel of. Well, then I've got Chris on. Yeah, that's Chris Kerr. I can see myself now. Yeah, I don't know how you, you're on twice. You've got your screen. I, I can't get rid of your screen, which is interesting. <laughs> so is that Chris's screen? We can see. Yeah. So you
I can't see where to, to give um I don't want to do that. So Alistair, do you have the option to present your screen? I can, but that'll just show all of you. But then you'll be able to click on the stop presenting your screen, I think. It's not been particularly responsive. Oh, goodness. I don't want to do that. So if I make Do you want to try and make me an organizer then I'll see if I can take There you go. Oh there we go. Is that you? Can you now So I think I've stopped presenting my desktop. If I click on so what can you see? Sorry, folks, we're just messing about now until quarter to seven when Stuart comes on. There's no obvious way to get everybody. Uh, and there are a few folks, I mean, I know for sure from back Teams back chat, I mean, a few of our folks are already on online. I, as I sort of said, I, I mean, I don't, you can't even sort of see, I mean, at this end, I can't even see. I can now see Ian and Chris. And you, Alistair, and that's it. I can see T Tim Hines is here from uh, um, Sage. From Sage. Mm -hmm. He's the only one I can see. But anyway, I mean, the, the, <laughs> the point was, of course, that actually, if we want to sort of deliver a kind of a higher quality digital experience, and we'll probably have to do something about that. Yeah. No, indeed. And not use this platform. So, um, okay. Um, what I'm going to do is try and, and get back to a, a space where um, we've got Stuart on. Um, so, I'm going to take Ian, Chris, and Chris out of the game. And then I'm going to put everybody on mute uh, and hope that um, when Stuart comes back, we can use his, uh, we can see his screen. Okay. So that's the end of the, the uh, AGM. Thank you very much. If you want to go and grab a coffee and be back in five minutes, need to do so. But I can't see Stuart. Stuart looks always nipped away, doesn't he? It's gone still. Yeah. Are you still here? Stuart was online earlier. Yeah, he was. He was on. Klaus, Michael, have you got access? Have you? Can you text him? And I'm. I'm here. I'm here, Alistair. Sorry. Stuart's here. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Oh, I cool. just can't. Yeah. I get ah, rid of that's, that's probably the best way around. Not at all. Right, and there's Ian gone. Ian, is that your screen? Uh, well, you can make Stuart a presenter. Yeah, Stuart is a presenter. There we go. So Stuart's not coming up in my... Wait, I'm waiting to view Stuart's screen. It's fine. I've got. I'm. I'm all all ready to go, Alistair. When you are. Okay. 
Do you want to wait until quarter two in case any of your colleagues come in from Sage? I think it's probably um, safer. Yeah. Just in yeah, case. Yeah, be good. Yeah. I think that's the time we kind of publish. So. Yeah. Okay. Smashing. Well, I'm going to go and grab a cup of coffee. Um, so thank you all very much. Um, I'll be back in two minutes, Stuart, to introduce you. Thank you. Hola.
Who is it? You come and say hello. Come be come. Come be come. Come on. Come on, man. Come be come. Come on. Come on, darling. Up. I'll see. Yep. Smash it. Okay. Um uh, my clock says that it's quarter two. So if it's okay, I will introduce you. Folks, um thanks awful much uh, for your patience. Um sorry about the about uh, the timing. It doesn't quite seamless from AGM into into Stuart's talk. Um I'm delighted uh to welcome Stuart Collins. VP of Experience and Design Small Businesses uh, from, from Sage to come and talk with you this evening. Um, she and I were talking earlier uh, prior to the AGM. He's been with Sage since 1989 in one guise or another. Um, so I think uh, a long service medal uh, as, uh, as as well uh, as, as coming to talk with, with us is to deserved. Um, Stuart's going to talk with us about embedding design principles um, and in particular, uh, how that's uh, been uh, implemented, looking at transforming Sage accounting. Um, Stuart's uh, going to talk for about half an hour or so, and then we'll have uh, questions at, at the end. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to get rid of my camera and hand over to, to Stuart. Thank you. Hi Alistair, well thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you this evening and uh, to be able to share a little about the journey that we've been on at Sage over the last few years as we um, move towards becoming a design first or experience first company. Um, I suppose one of the things we should probably do first of all is to try and talk about what we mean by design. So when we talk about design, we're not just talking about the user interface um, and the design in our products. We're talking about using design and techniques like design thinking, which I'll talk about in a little while, as a way to help everyone in Sage innovate, no matter what their role, whether they be in finance or the people department or building products. And to quote Steve Jobs, um, design is not just what it looks like and feels like, design is also how it works. Why is design important to Sage? Well, we live in a world now where um, actually, more accurately, we have lived in a world for quite a while where the customer has more flexibility, much more power in the choices they make, and they can easily find new solutions that they might be interested in. So with the power of Google, you can very quickly um, find lots of accounting software in the market. Um, and in fact, on this particular Google search, Sage was number two, which doesn't bode well. But it's very obvious that customers can, can move between these. Um, in days in the days past days, you'd have to install software. You'd have to go get that software from a vendor. You'd buy it from a store. You'd install it. You'd probably spend quite a lot of money in that investment, and therefore changing between products was something you didn't really do. But today, you can um, try uh, many different um, products in the, in the space of a few hours. So, from our perspective, we have to win customers, and we have to win them over every day from the moment they land on our marketing site. We have to route them to the right solution. And once they found that solution, we have to earn the right to keep them. And that means following them through their sign up journey, ensuring they get the most out of a demo. They probably go to start a trial and hopefully, of course, they ultimately become a customer and pay for the service. But that's not the end of the journey. We also have to continue to demonstrate value so that we can retain them as a customer for the long term. And it's user experience that we provide that will form a large part of their decision to stay with Sage or simply move to the next product in, the, in, the, um, in their Google search. So it, the role of design and in particular user experience is central to what we now do to deliver in our vision of becoming a great SaaS company. But it wasn't always like this. So as Alistair said, I've been with Sage a little while. So let's have a little bit trip um, back in time and um, and sort of go back to a prior period. Oh, I've gone too far. Um, 
so actually, uh, perhaps I'll stay here for a second. Um, as you can see, I, I, I joined um, a company that ultimately Sage acquired in September 1989, um, one year after I finished my GCSE. And my GCSE project is not actually obvious here, I've taken a, a bad photo, but that project and all that printer paper you can see there is actually an invoicing system for a small business. So you could say I've been eating McDonald's and building invoicing software or accounting software for pretty much more than 31 years. But anyway, enough about that. Um, let's quickly move forward again and um, get a bit nearer time. So in 2013, um, having been with Sage for many years and having worked in various different products, including things like Sage 50, um, I decided that it was time to make the switch to cloud. And it was, the world was very different. What we call today is experience design back then was almost unheard of. There was no real formal process. Um, there were some customer engagement events, but not many. And there was little uh, user experience or interaction design. It hadn't always been like that, but we had definitely lost our way a little. In fact, when I look at the team that we had at the time, there was only one person with a job title that had anything to do with user experience, and that was a usability specialist. We did have some people um, with the word designer in their job title, but they focused in that, at that time on making the application look, well, I, I guess you could say they focused on making it look pretty. So pretty, in fact, that for some reason, we decided to put, display a Sage logo on all the reports that were produced, including the customer's profit and loss and balance sheet. And actually, if I think back, we also chose to make it a rather, shade, rather nice shade of pastel yellow, um, which I guess made the Sage logo show up better because it was green. But of course, when the customer printed that, they got through lots of toner and ink. And there was another thing as well. If you, you had to work out how to make your printer print a US letter document on A4 paper. So can you imagine turning up to a meeting with your bank manager and showing them a company profit and loss statement with a big green Sage logo on it? No, neither could I. And it turns out that was really a bad thing to do. So in reality, there's a difference between what we call a UX designer and a UI designer. So UX designers focus on the user's needs, basing their work on the principles of human-centered design, producing wireframes, prototyping, understanding the tasks that customers complete, and identifying the key scenarios that they're trying to do in their business. They also look at things like how should information be organized, the structure of an application, the way in which users navigate and to find and process the information they need. Whereas a UI designer, or what we would call a visual designer today, um, and the only type of designer we really had in Sage One at that time, was far more focused on what Sage wanted, how our brand was represented, what typography or color palette we were using. Therefore, it's not really a surprise that we weren't clearly thinking very much about the customer and something had to change. It wasn't all bad. We had um, the start of a design system, so some basic patterns for reporting, both entry forms should work, and we had some patterns for how you should display lists. Um, but these were mostly delivered through what I would call a heavyweight composite component. So effectively, many controls put together in a way that you can't move and you can't change, and they're extremely inflexible in nature. On the other hand, they're great for consistency. We found that um, people could use the application quite quickly, but then everything the user was trying to do had to fit into one or two of these patterns. And that didn't really matter what customer problem we were trying to solve or whether it made sense to actually do that. Now in the desktop world that I'd come from, um, we, we struggled to embrace UX as a skill and a, and a talent. And we, um, we, we also found that there were a lot of constraints. So Microsoft would set standards for how Windows applications would work. Our UI technology in Sage 50 would make it harder to render the designs that we wanted. And there was also a certain amount of apathy with the developers who didn't really understand who these people were that were turning up, telling them how to change their application. And you can imagine the outcome. With Sage One, we knew we had to be different. The constraints of the desktop were no longer applicable. And with some effort and attention to detail, it was possible to render designs in a pixel perfect way. So we started to build a team, bringing a few individuals from inside Sage together and hiring UX talent from outside of the business. We also recognized that we had to be extremely close to other colleagues 
such as business analysts. And over time, those business analysts evolved and became what we, came, what we call today a solution designer, where their role is a combination of business analyst, domain expert, and part product owner. They tend to own features and see them through the delivery, all the way through from design to user interaction design, into engineering, through QA, and they support the product management team. So it's, I kind of touched on it briefly, but while we have um, a, a very strong skill set in experience design, we also depend heavily on colleagues engineering and product management. Because after all, it's no good of us coming up with great designs that are impossible, or in some cases too expensive to build. So anyway, fast forward a, a couple of years and we grew from that team of five to a team of 17. And that took a lot of convincing um, internally in Sage for us to start to take design seriously and a lot of recruitment. Um, and we actually started to make a difference. So I've got a short video that I'm going to try and play and I apologize the audio may not be great, but the video is really a highlight of, of where we kind of the work we did in 2017 and you'll see some of the changes that we managed to enact. So we'll see how this goes. Okay, so apologies, that's that's quite a fast moving um, video, but hopefully give you a bit of a flavor of some of the changes that we were able to instigate when we started working more closely with customers and also applying a more simplistic design and, and decluttering some of the forms and helping users complete tasks more efficiently. By now it's 2017, so just three years ago, and I have to remind myself often that it is just three years ago. The change that we've seen in Sage um, and in how seriously design has been taken is, is quite dramatic. And of course, Sage aren't the only company that are um, using design as a way to drive innovation and quality. And I was looking at this slide earlier thinking, I wonder how many people will have used some of these brands and how many of these brands I've used personally. And it turns out I've used them all. And it also turns out that this presentation was written on an Apple Mac using Google Slides while sitting in a Herma Millen chair and drinking an awful lot of Starbucks over the last couple of days. Um, and also that as I look out the window at my BMW that I probably won't get to drive for a little while longer. But these brands are all iconic and they're all there um, losing design to drive better outcomes for their business and their customers. So, we formed in 2017, we started to take um, experience, what we call now experience design very seriously. We uh, it, created a function within the business that works across product teams. It works across segments as well. So it's not just a small business segment. My responsibility is small business, but I have colleagues who are responsible for the medium segment in Sage. And we also have um, a team that work on the marketing site and .com. 
But I thought it was just worth running through a few of the principles that we set out in 2017 as to what would guide us in how we worked and how we um, solve problems for our customers. So the first one is our customers are our guiding light. So we have to have deep empathy with our customers. We have to take the time to understand their goals and the outcomes they're trying to achieve. We don't support speculation. Um, customer feedback is critical to our success. We insist on data to try and make decisions rather than just people's uh, views and thoughts. Everyone's, everyone's allowed to be part of the process. Everybody can have an idea, but we have to make sure we get to the best ideas and work hard to embrace our customers in the design process. Iterating as fast as possible to find optimum solutions. And I talked before about design thinking, which may be something you haven't heard of. So I'll just take a few moments to walk through what design thinking is and um, how it works. And there are quite a few different models, but they all kind of um, boil down to these five key themes, if you like. So the first theme is empathy. How do you empathize with your users? What do they think or feel? What are they afraid of? What dreams do they have? What do they hear when you talk to them? Who influences them? What do they see? What do they say or do? What's the attitude towards their job? Do they enjoy it? Do they not? Or actually, what's the attitude towards your product? And also, what's the what's the typical day look like for them? Before COVID, we actually would go out and visit customers in their workplaces and see what they did on a day to day basis. And if you've never done this and you're responsible for a product in some form, I'd recommend you do it as soon as circumstances to allow. It's something you just have to take time to do. I've never fail to learn anything from a customer engagement or a customer visit. The next phase is about define. So during the define stage, you take the information that you've put together from the empathy stage and you analyze those observations and try and synthesize them in order to create the core problems that you and the team are going to work on. And create an actionable problem statement, which is usually known and called the point of view. A point of view is usually based on deeper understanding of specific users, their needs and their insights about them. In the design thinking process, you use those insights in the field work from emphasize mode. It should the actual point of view should never contain a specific problem, nor should it contain an indication of how you're going to solve a problem. Instead, it should be wide enough for the scope, a wide enough scope for you and the team to be able to start thinking about solutions that go beyond the status quo. Once you've got your point of view, you start to look at an ideate phase. And the ideate phase is there for people to challenge all the assumptions and create as many innovative ideas and solutions as you can. And one way in which we do that is to ask questions that we phrase, how might we? So how might, me, how might we enable our customers to not only survive, but thrive? How might, how might we improve the way things work and operate for our customers? How might we remove data entry altogether? How might we use technology, whether that be something like artificial intelligence or machine learning, to automate finances and as much as possible and reduce time a business owner needs to spend? Because after all, most of our customers didn't get into business to do bookkeeping, unless of course they're an accountant, in which case we need to consider their needs too. So how might we give them insights into their clients? How might we improve collaboration between the client and the accountant? How, how might we keep them up to date with know your customer checks that they have to complete? And once you've got a series of those how might we statements, you then start to come up with prototypes and mock-ups that you're going to use and test with customers. Now, a prototype in this stage can be as simple as somebody drawing on a piece of paper. It could be um, something a bit more advanced. So we, at Sage, we, the design team tend to like to produce what we would call a high fidelity mock-up. And that high fidelity mock-up looks pretty close to what the final product might look like. And that has pros and cons. So from our perspective, it creates a really good impression of what we're intending to do. And sometimes from the customer's perspective, it looks like you've spent a lot of time and effort in doing it. And they don't quite give you the feedback you want in terms of they're not honest. They don't want to hurt your feelings. Um, so we often spend a lot of time uh, or a few minutes at the beginning, sorry, of, a, of, a, of an engagement to just explain, really, this is this took no time at all. It's really quick. And we do some changes live to show them how easy it is. But that's to encourage them to give us better feedback. 
But like I say, prototyping can be anything from um, a, a sketch on a piece of paper to something that's an interactive uh, design that you can play with. And then of course, the final part of the design thinking process is test. So test those solutions with customers. See what they see how they interact with them. Learn from them. Now I've drawn this at the moment as a as a kind of linear process. And for those of you that understand terms like waterfall, it looks like you have to go from one to the other. But actually, design thinking is not a linear process. So what actually happens is you will move between these phases as you provide more information. So for instance, the prototypes that you put out in front of as you start to build the prototypes, they might challenge some of the ideas that you had and cause you to go back and have new ideas or spend more time with back at the ideation phase. The testing of those um, prototypes will often send you back to new ideas as well. A customer will give you some information that you hadn't perhaps picked up earlier on. So you'll go back and you'll do ideation. It also might cause you to redefine the problem you thought you were trying to solve. And that's something which you know it gets a little bit frustrating, but as you move between these, but not as bad as actually getting to the end, testing it, learning you've got it all completely wrong. But this is the time to find that out. Finding it out at this stage is one of the cheapest times to do it because once we get past test and we go into engineering, that's when it gets expensive. So the more we can do it then during this design thinking process to define the problem, provide, provide a prototype, test with a user, and be confident that we're building the right thing, that saves money. So there's plenty of material on design thinking available and I've really only scratched the surface in the time that we have here, but it's certainly something that I would recommend that you, you look at. And it's also something that can be applied to lots of things other than software engineering or, or user experience design. To give you an, um, a bit of an example of what some, some of the insights we've had in the past. So very early on in Sage Accounting, if you wanted to view an invoice, you would often end up back in the edit screen. So if the customer wants to go and look at details, they would come back to the screen that looked a bit like this and they would be put into edit mode. Now, that's really dangerous because if they happen to type something by mistake and hit save, that change would be applied. So one of the things we got from some user testing sessions was how could we um, improve this so that customers didn't have a damp head, didn't risk um, corrupting their data and changing their data. And we came up with um, a view, a view page. So effectively, this gave us an opportunity to allow the customer to, to focus on viewing data. There's no danger of them making a, ch a change to this invoice without hitting the edit button, which is a very clear, distinct action. They can obviously do other tasks from this page as well. So they can create a copy, they can print it, they can email it. And there were a few other things that we hid underneath the more button that were less common. But using this design, putting this into production with customers and then measuring the interaction with those, those options quickly got us to a point where things in the move box, or the more box, sorry, were being accessed more often than we thought. So we thought they were infrequent. It turns out that customers started to want to do them more and more. So we iterated on the design and actually changed something like this. So this was the, within the same kind of time frame, a couple of months later, we brought out this new version of, um, of invoice view. And as time's gone on and we've spoken to customers more and more, we've found that we need to continue to iterate further. And we discovered more and more things we can do. So that screen has now evolved to this something like this. And this is the um, this is the this is screenshot was taken today um, to make sure that it was the, that it was the current one. And you'll see there's quite a few new elements in here. So customers weren't happy about not knowing when invoices had been sent or arrived. So we came up with this timeline that talks that shows clearly what's the state of this invoice. Has it been created? Has it been sent? Has it been viewed? Has the customer paid it? We also introduced the ability to take card payments directly in the application. And as you'll see at the bottom, the number of things you can now do with this document has grown further. We've added in the ability to create a recurring transaction. We've added the ability to attach a file. So we had a customer who um, who sells drawings for uh, floor plans for buildings, and that's his job. So one of the things he said to us was, look, I'd love to send the floor plan with the invoice from the software. And now I don't have to worry about keeping a record of which floor plans went to which customers. 
So actually, when you get an invoice from this customer now, you'll get an invoice for the work and you'll get an attachment, which is the drawing that he's done for you. So we continue to iterate this. Um, most of the changes on here are customer feedback led rather than just us. In fact, I think every, all the changes are like a customer feedback led. And you can now do a lot more with just an invoice screen than you could do before. And you can do it safely. So moving on to other principles that we have. So simple to get started, impossible to outgrow. So we strive to design an awesome first time use experience where we aim to return value to our customers as quickly as possible. And this is something we're, we're focusing on actually in, in our FY21, which we're just starting now. But there are things that we've done over the years that we thought were the right thing to do, but it turns out they weren't. So we're now reviewing every question we ask a customer as they sign up for the product to make sure it's delivering value to them and we're returning value to them as quickly as possible and try to work out what are the things that customers do. So for accounting, it's probably that first time they create an invoice, or maybe they don't do invoicing. Maybe they're a cash-based business and it's about recording expenses. For payroll, first time use would be, how quickly can I get an employee set up and get their first payslip processed? For accountants, it's probably about onboarding a client and how, how soon can they set up things like reminders for key tax dates. Our aim is to guide customers at every step to help them unlock the benefits of the ecosystem, whether that be features in the product, or perhaps they're using, uh, want to use a mobile application, or maybe they want to use one of the third party developers that we have who will add more functionality to their product offering. So we design beautiful seams. This is, this is something that um, a company like Sage has had to spend a lot of time thinking about, and we still have work to do. So we borrow and use technology from across different teams in the business. So our IT team provide all of our billing systems. We have a team internally, which we call Service Fabric, who provide shared services for things like banking data, identity, payments, and compliance reporting. Now, our goal is to not be hampered by the fact we have different internal organizational structure. And what we shouldn't do is expose that to our customers. So our customers should just see Sage. They should just see banking information. What they shouldn't see is something that we internally call banking cloud or potentially even something called Sage ID. So we aim to design seamless integrated end-to-end -end experience that bring together data and technology to delight our customers. We take the time to map out the customer journey understand their pain points, understand what delights them, and rather than starting with a replica of the existing product or just what we did last time. Every, every time we integrate a new service, it's an opportunity to learn and to improve things for customers. Establishing iconic ownable moments. So we look to try and create point, touch points within the product and outside the product that customers can actually kind of get a buzz from. So some examples of this would be the first time you took a photograph of a receipt and you see it processed into a transaction using auto entry. So literally turning paper into digital data and meaningful data right before your eyes. Or maybe it's when you're um, sat in the pub on a Friday night and your Apple Watch pings to let you know that that big customer has just, uh, just um, agreed the quote you sent them and you can have buy around. We know that a brand is a promise made and a promise kept. And we look to, look to build these experiences in our applications because the more ownable moments you create, the more customers connect with the software you're doing, the more you delight them, the stickier they become. So moving on, number five, we are all systems designers. So no one is an island. We take a pattern approach to design where there are common jobs or tasks, we will use common designs and components. This is something that has taken us a while to really get to grips with. And if you are, if you are a user of Sage Accounting, um, you're probably sitting there going, that's not right, Stuart, you don't do that. But it's something we're moving to. So we've experimented quite a lot. With, we're now getting to some good solid patterns that are starting to be repeated. And we've also started to contribute to what we call the Sage Design System. And this is publicly available. So um, if you want to go and have a look and see what we, we do on the site, you will be able to, I believe, from Friday, because I think it's being updated at the moment. But the design system site contains everything from simple things like colors, fonts, layout, um, to 
the components that we use in, in our component library, which are the building blocks that our applications are built from. There's also design patterns that talk about how to take those building blocks and components and composite them to solve common user problems. And also, we obviously have a section on content. So it's important that the way we talk to customers, the tone of voice and the wordings that we use is consistent across our products and applications. Until early this year, the design system was largely being created and maintained as an additional role for our designers. This meant progress was much slower than we want. So back in April, we actually assigned dedicated resource to continue to work on the design system and grow it. But it's not it, XD for us is a team sport. So it's not just those guys that are going to work on the design system. Uh, all of the segments will contribute back for things that are important to them. And I mentioned components before. So we actually have a component library in Sage, which we call Carbon, and this has been open sourced so that our third party ISVs can use it to build solutions that look very similar to Sage and to help blend seamlessly into our products and services. At the moment, this is based on React, but there is also an Angular version too. And being open source, we actually get contributions from other parts of the uh, other people as well outside of Sage. And there's quite one or two people who have developed, uh, contributed quite a lot back to the system. So design, as I touched on before, is it's not a department. So yes, XD exists in Sage or experience design exists in Sage as a, uh, as a function, but it is a team sport. So we take design and, and use it across all parts of the business. And it's a, we, we aim to make so user-centered design everyone's responsibility and nurturing design thinking across all business units and functions. A few months ago, Sage actually started to run internally what we call a product excellence course, uh, which is open to, as far as I know, anybody who wants to join. And that course has a, a number of sessions that are all around design thinking. In XD itself, we hold what we call design huddles. So these are a safe space where designers meet every two weeks with the entire department and everyone is invited along to do critique. So to provide feedback on the designs that they see make suggestions for improvement, ask why things work in a certain way. And also it's an opportunity to share with other colleagues outside as well, like product management. This not only helps drive alignment, but it's also paid dividends in breaking down silos between the segments. And the other teams always have something to contribute. Design for delight. So, this slide kind of covers most of the, the, the key points. So the illities, as we call it. So we have to design things that are stable, available, scalable, testable. We also have to create benefits that customers care about. It's no good delivering features if you can't articulate the benefit that brings to the customer. And that's you know it also has to be easy to use. And by doing those things, we look to create positive emotion. So great products deliver not only the benefits that solve the problem with leave, it would ease, they leave the user with a positive emotion related to that experience. We also try to celebrate customers' successes, big and small, because people remember not what you said or did, but how you made them feel. And lastly, well, not sorry, last but one, um, principle number eight, talk less, design more, code most. So talk is cheap when there's a lot of talking that happens at Sage and design flourishes when there is um, talking, but also we need to encourage learning, testing and iterating with our customers until a customer actually sees something. We have no idea if it's really going to be successful. As you may have noticed in the video earlier, customers love to get involved. And when you incorporate their feedback, they not only feel that you've listened, but that you've truly understood. There are always improvements that can be made. And delivering it to the as per the previous example and continually co-designing with customers allows us to de-risk development by being confident that we're tackling the right things that are going to make going to make a difference to our customers. The last principle is um, measure what matters. So we have to ensure that our design performance is measured and driven with the same focus and rigor as you would perhaps revenue and costs. Defining outcomes and setting metrics is important to understand what works and what doesn't. There's no point spending a lot of time designing and building features without having a measure of what success looks like at the end. And of course, defining a metric is only half of the problem. You also have to be able to make sure that you can measure it when the time comes. And we've fallen foul of this in the past where good metrics have turned out to be unobtainable. 
partly due to the implementation of the feature by engineering, which actually isn't their fault. It's rather a gap in our requirements. So now we ensure that when we define a measure, we also put the, the work into the requirements to provide the, spec, to provide the way in which that measure is going to be calculated and it's defined up front. We need to measure frequently and we need to make sure we understand the impact that we're using. So that covers the nine uh, guiding principles that we have in experience design. So I thought one, there's one more thing that I thought I'd come back to. So the size of the teams. So Sage has invested heavily in experience design. So we were a team of five in 2013, a team of 17 in 2017. Earlier in 2020, my team was 53 people. Uh, we are now recruiting and by the end of 2021, 20, uh, the team will be 111 people. So Sage is really committed to using experience to, and design to drive forward our products. And this is just the small business team. There are other teams in Sage of similar sizes. And in the true Steve Jobs fashion, I thought I'd give you just one more thing. So we talked about design thinking earlier, and there's a book that if you want to look at design thinking that I'd recommend, it's called Sprint. And this is written by a guy who used to work for Google Ventures. And it's a process that they would use to, uh, when they went into startups, to assess them and help them move forward. So we set a challenge for the team. And the challenge was, use this process, makes a big promise, right? Solve big problems and test new ideas in just five days. So we put groups of people together to actually look at a big problem, which was how do we help customers get to the right solution from sage.com and i'm just going to run a quick video and i'll let the video speak for itself but uh, you'll see the results are quite interesting video instantly shows me what it's going to look like on my computer and on my phone and that really speaks to me. I, I see 6 million customers worldwide so straight away I'm like right it's clearly good software. Visually far more appealing. The other, the other site was too busy on information whereas this is just straight in. It just yeah it doesn't look as kind of stuffy and traditional and complex as I had perceived Sage to be. I love this. I genuinely really like this a lot. That appeals to me in sales dashboard. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that you can see I always look for an example of what it'll look like because it has to look user friendly. This resonates with me, shall we say. I visually and the information I've got here. It's plain English. 
is concise. It tells me what I need to know. Yeah, those features really speak to me. There's the the kind of wrap up of all the other bits I need, and then it's like, right, do you want this or do you want this? Yeah, yeah. I love that. Okay, so hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight into experience design at Sage. And um, I have to say, I'm extremely privileged to work with a, a great group of people who are extremely talented. So um, without them, none of this would be possible. And uh, I should never forget them. And... Stuart, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, really, really excellent. And you covered so much ground, <laughs> so much of the well, I'll call it life cycle for want of a better word, that, that development process. And uh, you know, so succinctly, that was just amazing. Thank you. Most, most interesting. Um, if it's okay with you, I'm going to open it up to, to everyone for, for questions. <clears throat> and uh, I've unmuted everyone, I think. So if anyone has any questions for Stuart. Um, what I'd like to ask is, in terms of user experience, have you know, user experience as two components? I'm not, not getting you. You're very, very low. I think your microphone's up. Is that better? Is that better? Sorry about that. Better. <laughs> so, <laughs> did the design thing that come into play there about where yeah. the microphone was? <laughs> I, well, I'm, I'm, on my desktop, I've got like four computers, four monitors, two keyboards, three mice. Sometimes it gets a bit confusing. Anyway, back to in terms of user experience, some people say it's got two components. It's got like a usability part and a user experience part. How have Sage gone about ongoing measuring user experience? Because sometimes it's quite hard to capture user experience. Yeah, that, that we we have a system of measures. Um, I, I didn't put them into the slide because it was starting to get a little bit busy, but there are 14 um, metrics that we try and measure across user experience. So some of them are quite well known. So um, SUS is a is a quite a long standard measure, um, which is a system usability score, and it measures on ten questions and gives you a number between one and the hundred. And if you get eighty six, that's deemed to be reasonable. If you're less than eighty six, you've got work to do. And the questions are about how easy um, a customer finds to do a task, or how easy it was to get started, whether they found the system was insightful those kind of questions. We also look at things like Net Promoter Score. So do, do customers recommend the product that we produce? And if they recommend it, then the chances are, and, and I don't know if you know about Net Promoter, but the question from Net Promoter is, on a scale of zero to 10, how likely are you to recommend this product or service to friends and family? Okay. So it's, it's a really kind of personal question about, would you put your reputation on the line to recommend this product? And it's quite a harsh measure. So if you don't score somebody nine and 10, then your score isn't worth a lot to them. And if you score between zero and six, you're actually creating negative points. So the way the score is calculated is the percentage of nines and tens, less the percentage of zero to sixes. If you do seven and eight, you don't count. So the MPS measure for a, co a company like um, Apple is high, high 70s. Um, the MPS measure for Sage Accounting at the moment is probably about 30, and we need to work on it. Um, I am aware of one product I looked at once that had an MPS of minus 100, wow. which basically meant nobody would recommend it. Um, <laughs> so that didn't last for long clearly because we fixed those things and we started to work on but mps is used as a, as a metric customer satisfaction scores as well so we do quite a lot of surveys with customers in terms of csat um, active use is one of my favorites so when we produce a feature how many people are actively engaging with that feature because if they if you've built something in there and you're not using it there's a reason why either it doesn't meet their need or they can't find it or they never wanted it in the first place 
So <laughs> measuring those things is important to me and something that we um, we strive to do. But I hope that's a bit of a flavour of some of the things, but there's that, that, 14 in total, I'm afraid, on top of my head. I think. <laughs> It's a fairly brutal scoring, Stuart, I have to say. And, um, and yeah, PS but... that promoter really is. It, it is it is something which is used all over the it's not just a um it's not a UX score in particular, yeah. it is about recommendation. Yeah, that's um, excellent. Yeah. Sure I'm sure it focuses the mind. It, it does. Um, unfortunately, when you do things like ask people, uh, so you gave us an eight, what would it take to give us a nine or ten next time? Sometimes they come back with I never give nine or ten. Yeah. At which point, what do you do? Um, mm. And there are also cases when, if you read some of the research around it, there are cases when it's like the right thing to do with somebody who's scoring two or three is recommend the competition because yeah. you may not be able to make them happy. Um, uh -huh. They may may have the wrong product for them. So mm. not every customer is a customer you can convert and maybe the yeah, right yeah. thing to do to make them happy is to recommend an alternative product. Okay, excellent. Ad, you get your hand up. Ah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I don't know if you can see me. Uh, I just had to think that um, uh, if you want an example of a bad user interface, <laughs> we're using. No, I, I think that's actually a bad user. The interface is fine. It's uh, my incompetence. Although I have just tried to make you a panelist. All I've done is lose you completely. No, he's now, he's now a panelist. So I, I must admit, when I, was, I spent some time this afternoon with one of the colleagues on the call, actually trying to work out go to go to webinar, um, yeah. and it's not the easiest conferencing software in the world to get to grips with. Add a okay, question. So I saw a question in the chat that says, "What's the what software development process supports such design thinking best?" And I, in terms of we won't, we use. Agile in, in Sage, so um, breaking things into sprints, breaking them into iterations. So I, I don't think there's necessarily one, certainly not a waterfall development cycle wouldn't really help um, because you're trying to react to customers as you go. And the smaller the iteration, the less risk there is that you're doing the wrong thing and the more you can learn. So in some of the things we've delivered over the years, we did a, a piece of work around um, reviewing how the profit and loss worked, which was covered in that last video actually. and we knew from research we'd done probably what 30 40 percent of that feature should look like um, but we didn't have a clue about the last piece so we actually shipped the first piece we started work on the next piece because we knew what it was and then the customer feedback starts to flow and they shape the next two or three sprints afterwards mm -hmm. so we don't like to design everything up front we like to have a direction of travel because sometimes mm -hmm. that that will affect how you build something um, but certainly big scale you know, three, four month projects to design something is not what we do. Yeah. Um, it's no, too expensive and it doesn't give you what you want. Yeah. Um, diversity in your team. <laughs> so if I go back to uh, 2013, um, the team at that point was largely male. Um, and over uh, between 2013 and 2017, we actually managed to rebalance that quite well. We, for me, it's important that we do have diversity in the team. We get different thinking, different styles, different experiences. The actual spread, as you saw from the video of, of people, is uh, different backgrounds. Um, unfortunately, Alan, who was the older gentleman in the video, isn't with us anymore. Um, but he brought a very different uh, view and he, as an academic. He had been a, in user research for uh, for many years. And the team, when we, when we brought him on the team, the two guys that hired him had actually studied his work at uni. So it was a bit like um, meeting a, a god as far as they were concerned. They'd studied all of his papers and uh, they were delighted when he came on board. So with the, up until the point we started the latest round of recruitment, we were pretty much at 50-50. Um, we've just brought in about 23 people and that started to lean us more towards a male bias. Um, but we've got another 20, 30, 25, 30 roles to go. So we'll start to look at that as well. I don't actively seek diversity in recruitment we have to recruit the best people that are available at the time but we've been lucky in that it has worked out well for us from that recent times 
Thanks, John. I'm, I'm sure that you're, you're doing yourself down and, and you've got your your uh, adverts right in the language in your adverts, and I'm sure that encourages uh, diversity in recruitment. Yeah, I mean, if I, if I think back to the, the, the we've, we've, sent, we've swung more towards male candidates recently in terms of successful, but the diversity yeah. within that from a background perspective is massive. So yeah. we're diversifying in different ways. Yep, yeah. no, indeed. Tim, have you got your hand up? Yes. Hey, Stuart, quick question. Um, so, you know, it's amazing to see the difference between 2013 and 2017 in terms of tools, processes and technique. What's exciting to me is where do you think we're going to be in another four years? I know it's hard to predict the future, but where is experience design going in terms of the future? So I think from a, a future perspective, we need to get more into the customers than we are at the moment so at present we don't uh, we, we do as much as we can but there's much more that we can do we need to look at how we think across from a sage perspective how we think more across the segment so right now if you look at our marketing and you look at our products our, our website and what we actually build is different products so we build a payroll product we build an accounting product we build a hr product we build, we build um auto entry which kind of sits in its own category and what we really want customers to do is to buy into sage so from an experience design perspective one of our jobs is to get those products to look and feel similar so they won't be exactly the same because they're solving different problems but we should certainly be trying to design a common experience across them and also bring them together so the customer just buys a sage subscription um, so i think that's one of the, the big challenges for us in terms of how we can um, help the business navigate that and how we can help our customers get better insight from, or feel more connected to sage as a company okay thank you Thanks, Tim. Any last questions for Stuart? Okay. Last question. In terms of accessibility, was that quite easy to recruit people who had the necessary skills? Because I know there's lots of legislation um, and things to take into account. So was that factored into the design process? So accessibility is something that we are starting to take very seriously. Um, and in fact, we've hired recently a very talented um, gentleman who understands every, more than I will ever understand about WCAG and the, the relative guidelines. Um, HMRC are actually quite uh, aggressive in pushing software designers to take accessibility more seriously. And the new design system that I touched on is fully WCAG compliant as well. So it will take us a while to get those rolled out across all the applications. Um, and you're right, hiring people that are skilled in that area is a challenge. And as to my point before, we were very lucky when we were interviewing that somebody came to us and said, hey, I can do these things. Um, and his resume was brilliant and his portfolio was really good. So uh, he joined us about three weeks ago. So hopefully we'll start to see some differences from him. And we'll look to recruit more to support that as we go, by, go on. Excellent. Question. Well, listen, sure. thank you very much. It's been a... a excellent talk and uh, much better than the AGM has to be said although the bar wasn't particularly high um thanks all very much for your questions um and and Stuart for answering them so uh honestly uh, and and fully if we could do a, a virtual show of appreciation please thank you yeah thanks awful much um i uh, really appreciate it uh thanks everyone for the agm the minutes will come out uh in in due course um thanks uh, and be safe have a good night enjoy the rest of your evening thank you all thanks very much <laughs>